So hello and welcome to yet another episode of Biographics. I'm your interim host, Carl Small, and today we're talking about the Luddites raging against the machines. And as with all videos on this channel, this one is based on a script submitted to us by our team of writers. This one in particular being Larry Holsworth. If you enjoy what you read, give them a follow at the social links below. But let's get to it. The first industrial revolution which occurred in Europe and America from roughly the mid-18th century to the mid-19th centuries was a period of rapid and sometimes quite dramatic change. It sometimes defines the period which saw the shift from a largely agrarian society with manufactured goods produced by craftsmen to an industrialised society where machines did it instead. So machines took over roles that were previously filled by skilled men and women, and in doing so, eliminated long-standing occupations, basically eradicating them from history. As just one example, the spinning of yarn and thread along the domain of women in the household became mechanised. Yarn and thread became less expensive and more readily available for consumers, and at the same time, households in small towns and rural locales lost a long-held source of income. As the Industrial Revolution ran on, manufacturers, which is still an awesome word, I'm glad I get to say it out loud, emerged powered by wind, water, and eventually steam. For decades, water provided the most reliable power source, and it drove a continually expanding number of machines, grist mills, sawmills, looms, spinners, and other innovations of industry. Some were also powered by human feet, operating little pedals, like I'm doing right now to make sure my camera works. And the treadmill led to the employment of children. Many... wait, what? Oh, that, oh, that sucks. Anyway, many of these labour-intensive jobs in the factories became the occupation of children and child labour evolved into a social issue as well as an industrial one. Cities expanded as workers flocked to the urban environment, seeking employment for themselves and the other members of their households. Few cities were able to easily absorb the increases in population and tenements and slums became a curse on many. Appalling living and working conditions were just a part of the price of progress. Crime became a problem in crowded cities, ethnic neighbourhoods emerged, bringing with them the signs of intolerance and prejudice that continue to this day. While the owners of factories grew fortunes from their profits, the workers found themselves largely unable to purchase the fruits of their own labour. The result was resistance to progress, to innovation and to change. Each new invention found those who opposed it, each new system found those desiring to return to the old. The one certainty throughout the period was change, a certainty which some greatly feared. Beginning in the mid-18th century and largely driven by Great Britain and that nation's colonial empire, the Industrial Revolution saw machines replace human hands in the creation of many goods. Although the techniques of mass production using prefabricated parts did not emerge until the later in the period, raw materials such as flax and cotton were converted into usable fabrics through the use of machinery. Forgers shaped iron using hammers powered by water and later steam. Water power drove meat packing plants, moving animal carcasses to workers, bearing knives, axes and saws, again made by machines, and other machines of the bones of these animals into powder for fertilizer. Candle making, up to then the purview of housewives or skilled craftsmen, became a machine-driven industry. So did the rendering of fats to make lard, tallow, and soap. Many industries became regionalized based on the availability of the raw materials to produce the things they wanted to and to drive the machinery required to create them. With water being the primary source of power for many years, towns located along navigable waterways became industries. Water provided the means to receive raw materials, drive the machines that process them, and ship the finished goods to customers customers, all in one service as it were. Although machines assumed the burdens of manufacturing, they still needed workers to operate and maintain them. Workers were also needed to package the products, store them in warehouses, or prepare them for shipping. What had been small, relatively isolated towns became cities as workers abandoned their rural homes and relocated to these manufacturing centres. Machines to knit, spun yarn and thread into cloth first emerged in the mid-16th century in Britain. They were known as stocking machines, since the manufacture of knitted stockings was a major reason for their existence. Their operators were known as stockingers, which is a cute and wholesome word we should bring back. Early machines mimicked the motions of hand knitting and the operators required similar skills. By the mid-18th century, improvements to the mechanical motions of the machine, as well as its operation, had eliminated much of the human skill required. The machines were also expensive, meaning individual stockingers could not compete with the wealthier manufacturers manufacturers who purchased multiple stocking frames and established factories for the manufacture of knitted fabrics, including silk and lace. And we all know that stockings are better when they're made of silk and or lace. By the mid-18th century, Nottingham, England was a centre for the stocking frame. Richard Arkwright established a mill in Cromford where the stocking frames were operated by water power. The use of water power continued for decades in Nottingham. The advances in the machines produced less expensive wool and cotton stockings and other knit materials, as well as more luxurious silk and lace. Again, 
silk stockings. Like, they'll change your life. The advancers also displaced workers who had laboured at individual machines, then rendered non-competitive with newer mechanisation. Stockingers rebelled with the preferred method of demonstrating displeasure being the smashing of the expensive stocking frames themselves. By the second half of the 18th century, the rage against the machines was extended to the new mechanised spinning machines, which created yarns and threads, eliminating the jobs of yet more workers in Lancashire, a major spinning centre by 1760. Displaced workers joined their stockinger brethren in smashing the machines they perceived as the source of their employment woes. The protests and destruction of the expensive machinery grew to the point that textile manufacturers sought protection from both the Crown and from Parliament. In 1788, a member of Parliament from the textile manufacturing districts introduced the Protection of Stocking Frames Etc Act of 1788. Daniel Coke, MP representing Nottingham, argued the willful destruction of stocking frames and other textile industry machinery should be punishable by the infliction of the death penalty. Yes, they literally wanted to kill people for hitting machines with hammers because the machines represented profit and you don't interfere with a rich person's profit even a little bit. Parliament debated and ultimately agreed to enact laws to protect the industry but declined to go as far as to make the destruction of a stocking machine punishable by death. Instead, the act made attacks which led to the destruction of stocking frames and the machinery like it, a crime which led to forced deportation for a period of 7 to 14 years for each individual offence. You can only imagine there were judges who got very creative with that and just listed like, you know, each swing of the hammer as a separate offence. Yet attacks and destruction of stocking frames and other machines continued and in 1812, Parliament modified the previous act citing its ineffectiveness in protecting the machines of industry. Judges were given the authority to sentence offenders to alternative punishment at their own discretion, which did include the death penalty or lengthy prison terms. So yes, they would literally kill people for destroying machines in factories because the people who own those factories were rich enough to bend the ear of um, uh, the right people in power and get them to lay down those punishments. Sure, I'm glad we passed that today, right? Aren't you guys? The increased use of machines led to the creation of the factory system, which in turn led to less expensive and more available goods in many industries. Productivity increased, towns grew into cities, cash money in circulation increased, and the quality of living increased for many. Many more were left on the side though, and those are the ones we're talking about today. Jobs in the new factories were increasingly dependent on unskilled labourers, which were cheaper for employers to hire and or replace. Skilled workers found they were pretty undesirable in the grand scheme of things to factories unless they were willing to work for considerably less money than they were used to receiving for their labour. The steadily increasing number of factories in industrialised areas were erected with little concern for the comfort and indeed safety of the workers. Conditions were harsh, lighting, ventilation and space to move about were inadequate in most factories, hours were long, wages were paid by the day or week rather than by the hour, and in some industries wages were determined by the number of goods completed rather than by the length of time it required to produce those goods. Where in the early days workers in some industries we for example enjoyed some protections by joining together in crafts and guilds, the factory workers had no such organisations. Unions were non-existent and protests against conditions or against the low wages typically paid invariably led to dismissal and in some cases prosecution. Blacklisting disruptive employees made them pretty much unemployable and was effectively a death sentence, if not financially, then quite literally for some people. The new factories established a theretofore unknown labour pool, preferring to hire women and young children. They were viewed as less likely to complain and were considered to be more docile. They were also paid less. Child labour quickly became the norm in factories in Britain by the late 18th century. Larger families led to more potential earners under the same roof, so people started having more kids so they could send them to the factories to work. Children who had been in an early age apprenticed out to a man Master to learn a trade with room and board as recompense became unskilled labourers living at home on a pittance. The factories also became a major source of pollution, discharging their waste into the waters that also powered their machines. Later, when steam power was introduced, it led to the heavy consumption of coal, which polluted the air. So air and water are gone and the land's not looking too much better as well. This led to cities becoming known as pretty unhealthful sites, dominated by crowded housing, smoky air, reeking waterways, and a grumbling, discontented population of people who probably smelled real bad. Employers in the factories of the Industrial Revolution did prefer child labour whenever possible. They saw many advantages to the use of children. For one, they were more easily ordered about, and they lacked the ability to resist through protest or through force. They were also able to be paid less, earning as little as 20% of one adult male would be paid for the same task. Corporal punishment was common in the factories, and where an adult male could be expected to physically resist punishment, you know, just knock his supervisor the f*** 
out for trying that sh**. A child would likely not, and a child who did resist could be more easily subdued as well, or simply just ordered to go away. Children also offered the advantage of a smaller size, a significant asset on the shop floors crowded with machinery. They could crawl into spaces inaccessible to adults, reach into the nooks and crannies of machinery that was too small for adult hands. And what few laws did apply to labour during the early days of the Industrial Revolution favoured the employer and not the workers, regardless of age or sex. Children worked shifts as long as 16 hours per day. Their age was of little importance to their employer. What mattered most was obedience, size, and coordination. Please don't take that out of context. The attitude of most employers towards their workforce, including children, remember, during the Industrial Revolution was summed up by an 1832 House of Commons report. By that time, the attention to the plight of child labourers in the British factories had become a social issue, a situation which did not exist in the late 18th century. The report stated in part, and I quote, workers are often abandoned from the moment an accident occurs. Their wages are stopped, no medical attendance is provided, and whatever the extent of the injury, no compensation is afforded. Speaking of children being injured, this was pretty common in factories throughout the century or so during the Industrial Revolution. These injuries included, but were not limited to, crushed hands and feet, maimed and lost limbs, the loss of eyes, burns, disfigurement, and all too often, death. And there's not any details in the script, but I have read about this um, uh, when writing and researching other articles and scripts, and also during my like um, uh, schooling. And stories of children just being trapped or crushed by machines were so common that there's like, artwork of it in history books and it's like okay speaking of which charles dickens was a leading critic of the use of child labor and he knew what he was talking about having been a child laborer himself while his father sat in debtor's prison by the time dickens wrote his most famous works the use of children in the industrial workforce was a century old towards the end of the period recognized as the first industrial revolution the british government finally took action regarding the use of child labor and in the early years of the 19th century it passed a series of laws known as the factory acts in 1819 it established the first law in britain regarding child labor decreeing that children were limited to a work day of just 12 hours. Ain't that sweet. The emergence of factories required several factors to be in place to ensure their success, mostly a source of power, wind or water in the early years of the Industrial Revolution, later supplanted by steam engine, a means of transporting finished goods and receiving raw materials was likewise required, usually waterways, highways, that sort of thing, and eventually railroads. Another necessity was the labour force. Towns surrounding industrial areas grew as families migrated to them. For the towns, the Industrial Revolution imposed demands for housing which increased throughout the period. The burst of population growth in these towns and cities created crises that they were, to put it lightly, ill-equipped to face. Since recorded time began and people gathered in communities, poorer areas of settlements existed. The Industrial Revolution led to a steady increase in the size of these poorer areas. Most factory workers commuted to their place of employment on foot or if they were in larger cities, in tumbrels, wagons or omnibuses. They needed to live where they worked. The Industrial Revolution led to the expansion of slums and tenements in the industrial areas, many of which gained well-earned infamy. In British cities such as Birmingham, Nottingham and Liverpool, hastily built multi-unit tenement housing sprouted. Most units held entire families, grandparents, parents, children and relations by marriage in one or two rooms, which must have made making all of those babies that they needed to, you know, go work in the factories for a pittance really awkward when you think about it, right? your entire family is in one or two rooms. How are you making more babies? So the tenements were often built back to back with narrow mews or alleyways between them. The alleys housed the common privies and trash pits where clothes were laundered and hung to dry. And these tenements were very often overcrowded and seldom had running water or even a well. And just in case it wasn't depressing enough, it's noted that most of the time these buildings would just house workers from the same factory. As coal emerged as the primary source of fuel for heat and for power in the factories, the air in most cities became foul with its smoke. The waters of nearby streams became equally foul, polluted with the coal, ash, the offal of humans, and the effluence of the factories. Crowded streets were further clogged with animal waste, the bodies of dead animals, and of course, the poop people were throwing out of their windows. In the United States, like during the Industrial Revolution, several cities just allowed pigs to wander the streets freely, taking advantage of their pension to eat virtually anything, including human effluence. The Industrial Revolution didn't just change industry and cities, it also changed agriculture. The development of machinery for farms, like mechanized seed drills and threshing machines, increased the 
the productivity of farms while reducing the need for farm labourers. This led to a push from the agrarian regions to the urban areas, which offered the pull of jobs. Most migrating from the farms to cities were poorly educated and unskilled, the perfect fodder for the labour force demanded by these new factories. They, of necessity, sought the least expensive housing available in their location, feeding the expansion of poorer areas into the cities and exacerbating all of the issues mentioned previously. In the early 19th century, the Napoleonic Wars in Europe at their height, the new movement began in Great Britain. Many of the worst conditions of the Industrial Revolution had yet to take hold. Few factories were powered by steam, and the smog and pollution of the ensuing decades had not yet marked large cities to the degree they later would. Yet workers in Britain, especially in the textile industry, had already seen enough and they didn't want any more. The British economy was strained by the effects of the ongoing war with Napoleon, trade embargoes imposed by the United States and international disputes with Sweden and Russia, food prices where food was available were high, and so were the prices for fuel, clothes, and other finished goods. The textile industry was in a downturn due to shortages of raw materials, and across Britain, inflation was high and wages depressed. The British government largely ignored domestic issues with its intention focused on the war with Napoleon. Britain largely maintained that war by offering financial support to potential allies. On the night of March 11, 1811, disgruntled textile workers gathered in Nottingham, demanding increased pay for their labours. British troops were called in to disperse the protesters. As they did, another group of protesters smashed weaving machines nearby. It was the first indication to the authorities that the protest might be well organised and indeed planned. They were, with the textile workers involved, meeting in secret in isolated areas and selecting the targets of their protests. The group selected textile mills, smashed the machines they found there, and then vanished into the night. They targeted the machines which they deemed presented the greatest threat to skilled labour in the regions in which they were found. Over the course of the next several months, they targeted knitting frames in the Midlands. In Liverpool, steam-powered looms were destroyed in their protests. And these protests, if you've not guessed it by now, were the work of the Luddites, who, for anyone curious, took their name from a fictional protest who smashed a frames in 1779 in a possibly apophrical story named Ned Ludd. So Ned Ludd, Luddites, and the Luddites were noted as being highly organised and they struck frequently enough where the authorities were kind of tired of what they were doing. So the term Luddite has come to refer to someone who opposes advances in technology and the changes they wreak on society. A Luddite rages against the machines of progress, but the machines, though they were the physical targets of the Luddite protests, were not the real targets of their activity. Many of the leaders of the Luddites were skilled labourers who used the machines of the textile industry. Instead, the Luddites protested against the use of machines to displace skilled labour and produce cheaper products with unskilled labour. And though today the term Luddite is largely used as a pejorative. If you go back and like you know look at the demands they had in their protests and read their manifestos, you'll notice some stark similarities to labour disputes today. For example, the Luddites wanted to end child labour, they wanted higher wages for skilled workers, better working conditions in factories, and union representation for all people working within them. Though they were organised, there were different Luddite movements, each related to the specific section of the textile industry in which their members were employed, but ultimately they all had the same goal. Better representation for workers, more compensation for the workers working in factories, and, you know, not literally feeding children into a machine to feed the profits of capitalism. You can't, I can't think of a more overt symbol of like the cost of progress than they were literally just pushing children into machines. <laughs> There's the old joke, isn't like the orphan crushing machine of like, oh, well, you know, we've, we've dished, we got rid of the orphan crushing machine. People don't know the reference that it's a, it's a, it's just an internet idiom of like, oh, we finally managed to shut down the orphan crushing machine. It's like, but why does the orphan crushing machine exist? The British government responds to the Luddite movement by strengthening the Stocking Frames Act, allowing judges to impose the death penalty to violators. They also dispatched troops to quell the protests, leading to armed clashes where some protesters were killed. In 1813, over 12,000 British troops were occupied in suppressing the Luddites, a larger number of troops than those fighting Napoleon's army in the Peninsular War. The acts of the Luddites drew the attention of Lord Byron, who became a vocal and ardent supporter of their goals, which to his mind had been distorted by the government and the British press. Byron addressed the House of Lords in 1812, describing his impressions of the workers in the British factory system. He spoke in denunciation of the changes to the Stocking Frames Act, telling the House, and I quote, I have been to some of the most oppressed provinces of Turkey, but never under the most despotic of infidel governments did I behold such squalid wretchedness as I have since my return in the very heart 
of a Christian country. In 1813, over 60 men were arrested and tried in York under the terms of the Revised Stocking Frames Act. 30 men were eventually acquitted. Those found guilty were subject to harsh punishments. At least 17 were executed, and as many as a dozen were deported as convict labour probably to Australia. The harsh response of the British government to the Luddites, as well as to what was largely described in the British press as an insurrection that benefited Napoleon, led to them being condemned in the public mind for decades. And even to this day, the term Luddite is a pejorative to many, describing someone fearful of technology and the changes it brings. In more recent scholarship, though, they have been viewed somewhat differently, you know, especially considering what they were ultimately fighting for was stuff that we're still arguing for today. Eventually, social reformers and common sense caught up with the technological changes wrought by the Industrial Revolution, or at least some of them. Later governments came to realise that societal problems were both reflected by and created through the use of children to manufacture the products consumers purchased. Workers organised and demanded better wages, better working conditions, access to medical care, all of which, as we mentioned, were changes demanded by the Luddites during their brief time on the stage. A second industrial revolution occurred at the beginning of the 19th century and continued throughout the first half of the 20th century. Organised labour and management addressed the problems of the first industrial revolution through various means, some successful, others not so much. Company towns, labour riots, union busting, scab labour, minimum wage laws, child labour laws, mandatory school and attendance laws, and countless other efforts to prevent the problems born in the first industrial revolution have all come about. Some solved problems while creating new ills which were, as of yet, unsolved. The industrialised world still deals with overcrowding in cities, industrial waste polluting waterways, overtaxed wastewater treatment systems, unhealthy air quality and other societal issues which first appear during the shift from an agrarian to an industrial society. Today it's robots and AI that threaten to replace skilled workers with machines. The use of fossil fuels is threatened, if that's the word, by alternative sources of renewable energy, including wind and water power, somewhat ironically given everything we've talked about today. Just as the workers in various industries once felt threatened by the emergence of machines, so they are threatened again. Bring it back to the Luddites, they do not react with blind rage against the machines which arrived to change the future. They protested the means by which some, the few, exploited those machines and what they produced at the expense of those who were less fortunate. They demanded a fair wage for a fair their day's work producing a quality product which reflected their skills and benefited the consumer. To some, such a desire was and remains simply unattainable, quite unfortunately. There is an old saw which states that a modern day Luddite had invented a machine which would destroy all technology. And that was never really the goal of the Luddites, instead they wanted all to see the benefits from technology, with the benefits derived equal to the effort put in. Only time will tell if such a goal was attainable, but one thing is certain, advances in technology are not going to stop, whether those advances are attained by humans or by machines they create is something that remains to be seen. So hopefully everybody enjoyed this video, I certainly enjoyed presenting it. As noted at the start, this video was based on original scripts submitted to us by Mr. Larry Holsworth. Links to their socials alongside my own can be found below. If you like the video, leave a like. If you've got anything to say about it, any topics you'd like us to cover in the future, do so in the comments below. If you want to see more videos like this, subscribe. Go to our like, sister channel, Geographics and Top Tens, to see um, uh, you know more content from, like, you know, from our handsome team and stable of writers. You can see more of my content at Facting with Carl Smallwood and Wiki Weekend as well as going through the archives of top 10s, Listverse, Today I Found Out, and countless other websites, um, for which I probably wrote at least, I think, last count, like 3,000 scripts for various websites online. So chances are you've probably seen some of my work elsewhere, and thank you if you have. Like, you know, I didn't get paid for it for the view, but I did get paid for writing initially, which is always appreciated. 